couple things. Uh, the way the multi, Adam had asked if we could create the multidisciplinary clinic that CG created at this meeting. And a couple things that's very important to know is that um, uh, Dr. Gimeno felt that patients shouldn't have to pay for these consultations. And so um, he has really educated all of us and um, all of us actually have devoted our time. And so the way the clinic was set up, patients would come and we really didn't have um, a full set of records except their sleep study. And if, if one of us had seen the patient, then we might have their records. Um, but oftentimes patients came and this was the first time we had met them. So I wanted to introduce the, the team here. And if you could stand as I introduce you. Um, but Dr. Dan Blum, and uh, Dr. Blum is a sleep psychologist and a researcher at Stanford. His commitment to a multidisciplinary treatment approach really comes from both a professional experience as a former fellow at the Sleep Center and as a former patient of CG and Dr. Lee. Um, thank you, Dan. And Christina Semenik is a speech pathologist specializing in oral facial myofunctional disorders. She works both clinically and as a lecturer to advance the role of speech therapists in the multidisciplinary treatment of sleep disorders. Thank you, Christina. Dr. Choi is an allergist, uh, Carmen Choi. She's been in private practice for 25, 24 years and is involved with the management of sleep disorders for the last 15 years. She was mentored by Dr. Dr. Gimeno, who raised the awareness of sleep disorders, especially that of upper area resistance syndrome and rhinitis, and has been working with the multidisciplinary team in the treatment of sleep disorder breathing. Dr. Sullivan is a pediatric pulmonologist, and you might not have known that earlier, um, but she's a sleep physician for patients really of all ages. She's worked at the Sanford Sleep Medicine Clinic for 12 years, working alongside Dr. Gimeno and the multidisciplinary team represented here to advance early detection and treatment for sleep apnea. Thank you, Shannon. And Dr. Casey Lee is both an otolaryngologist and an oral surgeon. <laughs> Did you catch that? <laughs> he's in, he's out. <laughs> um, so he brings a very unique perspective and the fact he can really treat anything from the neck up. Um, but in treating patients with sleep apnea, he um, provides a multidisciplinary approach. He started the multidisciplinary treatment clinic with Dr. Gimeno back in 1998, and he's been very active in helping patients with all of us for many years. I also wanted to um, thank and introduce the panelists, um, uh, Ari Burwald, um, Janie Sito, we lost one. She and, won't be back. And Bailey, <laughs> we'll reintroduce Bailey when she, she comes she, back. Yeah, it's like the wedding chapel. She ran. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give her some time. Yeah. And of course, everyone knows Adam. So I just have a few graphics here. And let's see. So I'm going to show it on this slide here. Do you have the clicker over there? I do. Perfect, perfect. So uh, the, uh, this is a, the basic tenet of breathing. You're breathing in and you're breathing out. But if we look behind the soft tissue and we look at the anatomy, the area where the collapse is is um, right at the throat. And so if we strip the anatomy or strip the soft tissue and look farther back, then we can see the path of airflow. And why are all of us involved in this is because that path of airflow, it touches all of our specialties. So the site of collapse is where you see the sleep physician, the ENT, and the head and neck surgeon. But it actually involves a psychologist because um, breathing is under neural regulation. Um, it affects the nose, it's the space inside the, with the ENT and the allergist. And below that plane, the palatal plane, it's the orthodontist and the speech therapist. And farther down, it's the sleep physician and the pulmonologist. So the way we'd like to structure this then is um, each of the panelists have about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to tell their story and patients would show up to the, to the multidisciplinary clinic with specific needs. Um, sometimes they were screened uh, and the sleep physician would then ask them to come to the multidisciplinary clinic just for more input. So we'll start with Ari. Um, all right, so as a... Uh, I guess my issue sort of began as a child. I had very severe um, 
eczema and asthma and allergies to foods and to pollens and other airborne material. And so the, the assumption was that my sort of sleep ish has always been terrible due to those factors. Um, like the eczema, for instance, a lot of nighttime itching and pain, so obviously that leads to disrupted sleep. And of course, allergies, a lot of nasal congestion, so a lot of mouth breathing uh, also leads to disrupted sleep. And as it, I guess, is becoming more common knowledge now, um, also changes in the way that the jaw and other uh, facial bone structures grow. And uh, so that was, and possibly because of that or because of some other issues in my life or the interaction of those issues, um, a lot of psychiatric kind of stuff as well. Um, and so one thing I'd be interested in, in knowing more about is how uh, one's psychology can affect. So we know neurology obviously affects breathing patterns and sleep, but I'm also curious as to know how psychology can influence that. Uh, and one thing just recently occurred to me is I was uh, pretty much suicidal my whole life. And one time a neighbor told me about ninjas or somebody and how when they were captured, they would swallow their tongues to, to die and avoid spilling secrets or whatever. And so I'm just wondering if something like that kind of got lodged in my subconscious. And since I wanted to die, um, perhaps subconsciously at night I was like instructing my tongue to, oh, I'm going to swallow my tongue and put an end to this misery. I don't know, that's completely hypothetical, but something I'd be interested in, in um, sort of pursuing more and understanding better. Um, so then my sleep really took a turn for the worse sometime when I was about 20, 19, 20, 21, somewhere around there. And uh, that's also when I started seeking clinical um, psychologist help and psychiatric help. And so, you know, they obviously, they looked at me and they said, oh, you're super depressed. Well, that's why your sleep is impaired, right? It's obviously, it's a secondary thing. And so for like a decade, um, I just thought, okay, I'm, I, I'm sleeping terribly because I'm, you know, depressed and anxious and possibly is uh, side effects of the variety of medicines I was put on. And and then around 2010, um, actually, probably about two years before then, um, my brother was taking a class with Dr. Dement, actually, at Stanford. And he told me, he said, hey, uh, you've got to, you should get a sleep test, right? Because sleep has so much effects on all this stuff. And maybe it's the sleep which is causing all these other issues. But I, you know, I heard him, but I didn't really process it and I didn't pursue it until a couple of years later. Um, I think my mom uh, met um, a sleep technician who was raving about, you know, the, the possibilities and the complications and all that stuff. And so finally I went in for a test and lo and behold, you know, I had sleep apnea. I think my age, I was 50 or 60. Um, and, and that's when I started getting treatment for the sleep apnea. Um, and as it turns out, some of the treatment that I was getting to handle the insomnia and other issues with sleeping and, and depression, uh, clonazepam in particular, which I was on, was making the sleep apnea much, much more severe than it needed to be. And I, that brings up a very important point in, in my mind in my life, which is you've really got to know like what you're treating and what the side effects of that treatment are. And, you know, I, I'm, this has been talked about, of course, but, but to me, that's like very, it's a very important point to me. Um, so then I was put on, uh, I started CPAP, and that was some improvement. Um, but then I discontinued the clonazepam, and that actually had a greater improvement. And the, the brain fog that I've been suffering from for, for years and years lifted to a degree. On the other hand, it also made the CPAP treatment not as, or the cost benefit of the CPAP treatment was not as good for me anymore. Whereas before I was sort of more chronically tired and when I was asleep and I would like wake up a little bit, I could fall back asleep 
because of the influence of the clonazepam. So when I discontinued that, um, I would still wake up at the night, but since I was just a little bit less tired, I wouldn't be able to fall asleep again with the, the air blasting at my face. And also had some other issues like uh, mask didn't quite, I went through many masks, none of them really fit that well, and so I'd get leaks and shoot, shoot air into my eyes, and that was not fun. <laughs> um, a lot of times I'd get air into my uh, stomach, and that also was not fun. And so after roughly two or three years of using CPAP uh, consistently, I realized that the, it really wasn't producing the enhancements in, in life quality and cognitive ability that I was hoping. And on the days and eventually weeks when I did not use it, I didn't really notice any, any change, any decrement. So I just decided to, um, that CPAP was not really working for me very well. Um, during this time, I also used an oral appliance, which on the whole I think is a very good idea. Um, I had a couple issues because of long-standing bruxism. Um, my teeth are worn down very significantly and so it made the anchoring of the device somewhat of, a, of an issue. And also it produced some sort of torquing on my lower teeth. And, but the biggest problem was because of the long-standing bruxism, I would break the fins on the device very frequently. And my insurance didn't cover it, so I was looking at a lot of out-of-pocket expenses. And, the, and, and again, the efficacy that the oral appliance was giving you was not astonishing. It, it was perhaps a minor improvement, but it was nothing really, really earth-shattering. Um, my sleep was still disturbed. And so I decided it was just not worth, you know, every six months to year getting a new, uh, a new device made. And let's see, I guess that brings us to today. <laughs> so, um, so right now your uh, sleep apnea is not being treated. Um, well, not being right. Okay. Um, so. Well, I, I do positional kind of things, like I sleep on my stomach or my side as much as possible, but no sort of uh, like medical intervention. So the question would be, you had a couple of good questions. Um, one you wanted to ask Dr. Plum. Um, and so then um, I know Dr. Choi had some comments also about his case and uh, Dr. Lee and, and Christina. So I'm gonna pass this. <coughs> um, thank you for the question and- uh, You can stand if you oh. want, whatever's more comfortable for you guys. Uh, Sure, maybe I'll just stand <laughs> over here. So you want to come up here? Our as well. Um, okay. So your question was more on um, if there's a psychological component to that was kind of contributing to the suicidal thoughts um, and then that leading to the disruption in your sleep. Okay. It's a great question. I've never heard that question before. Uh, from what I know would, and the overlaps of these fields, that the lack of sleep can enhance the suicidal thoughts and tendencies um, in that kind of direction, and then those will then start to feed on each other, but not in as much of a way of um, then uh, causing the tongue, or psychologically causing the tongue to go backwards, but it's definitely possible. I think from some of the other, uh, one of the other panelists here, we'll be able to talk and speak more towards um, tongue exercises in the other direction to really help you with uh, sleep. Um, what I can say is that as you get your sleep treated more consistently, um, it can start to reduce that suicidal thoughts, improve the mood, stabilize it as well, because we don't want it to be uh, too elevated going into kind of the mania as well. Um, did that kind of answer your question on the relationship between sleep and those types of thoughts? Uh, yeah. I, my uh, thought on that is that that link I think should be looked at a little uh, you know more in depth as as many of these things are you know more funding and more research interest should be devoted towards it um, but you know it occurred to me that that could be a possibility because you know all of us uh, or most of us don't wet the bed right and so if we have a full bladder we'll wake up so there's obviously some level of conscious control being exerted right some sort of conscious awareness even when we're asleep and so I was just thinking, well, you know, it could go both ways. 
sort of. And, and that led me to the follow-on thought, which is perhaps there's maybe some sort of training program that could be done to sort of uh, monitor sleeping and kind of just like monitoring for full bladder, monitoring for lo lack of uh, breathing and maybe some sort of automatic response to that that isn't normally part of the normal human growth pattern but could be trained. Yes, that's a great thought and I will hand it off to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so habits is me. Uh, so I'm Christina, so myofunctional therapy. I'm a speech pathologist and I specialize in myofunctional therapy and I train all of those conscious habits which the hope is then to make them unconscious. So Ari and I had, had met earlier um, and yeah, so do you remember some of those habits that we kind of talked about earlier that we would love to retrain? There were a few. Uh, the resting posture of the tongue is really the biggest piece. The idea with the resting posture of the tongue is that during sleep, we want that tongue to be up and suctioned against the roof of the mouth. The idea is that we want it to be out of the airway and not falling back into the airway during sleep. Um, with R, we do notice a slight lisp, right, when you're speaking. If the lisp is, is just as a general speech pattern, we're not concerned. What I'm more concerned about is that it's a, a forward posture of the tongue. And that's telling me that, hey, maybe there's some weakness in the tongue, maybe the tongue is just in the wrong spot. So we want to make sure that the tongue is there back and up, okay? That's what we want. We do not want that tongue touching the teeth, okay? And we can train that habit. We can make that happen. It's actually not even that much work. Stacy, I fix those kids pretty quick and send them right back to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a big piece. The other piece of mild functional therapy, what else do we do with our tongue? We rest and we swallow. Um, so one of the things that already disclosed to me earlier was that he was feeling some discoordination when he was swallowing saliva, when he was swallowing pills. I think a lot of us kind of like have a little difficulty when we're swallowing pills or like do weird things and like contort ourselves to swallow pills. Um, and that's a really common symptom in the sleep apnea population. I think there's a subclinical dysphagia or swallowing disorder in this population. Um, and that is actually something that we would target as well. Um, one of the things you were highlighting um, was actually, you know, that you were soft spoken or you felt like you weren't projecting. So vocal projection or voice is something else that we would target. That's coordination of those respiratory muscles and something else that we could target if you chose. Yeah, so resting posture, swallowing, anything else that you have any questions for me? That's it. I think that's most of it for you. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, so let's test on. So in order to be able to have all of that. Oh, actually, there was one thing that I did want to comment on. You had said that you were rejected your CPAP because you were, were feeling that air really rushing into your mouth at night. Um, so we do want to make sure that we are breathing through our nose at night and we do want to make sure one of the things that we can do is um, establish that nasal breathing. Um, that's a big piece. Oh, sorry. We want to make sure we are breathing through our nose at night um, and that is something that we can help with as well in speech therapy. Okay, so to make sure we can breathe through our nose, let's pass it on to Carmen. Um, yes, um, that's a rather... Um, uh, a difficult story to hear uh, as far as the allergist is concerned. Um, and I think it kind of reflects back to what uh, Dr. CJ was talking about. The allergy started when, it was sh when he was a kid. And this is where we really need to pay attention to treating our kids or the uh, children early, um, addressing the allergies and don't kind of write them off. Um, so, do you still have your allergies? I, I saw from the history that you still have your allergies right now? No? Uh, yeah, I, I still have. Yeah, I have so a lot of a post-nasal drip is my major complaint in like phlegm production and that kind of thing. Um, and that was also in your history that there was some, so, uh, some mention of reflux, correct? Yeah. So, do you know how much allergies you truly have? Is the, is the drip really dripping down from the nose or is it just a lot of throat mucus in the throat here? Uh, it definitely feels, and uh, based on what I spit up, uh, it, it looks more mucus-like. But is it dripping down the back of the, uh, back of the nose? I believe, yes. So that's two things. Um, number one, if you're not wearing your CPAP, I would definitely get your allergies treated 
uh, have seen an allergist and get that evaluated because without the CPAP, you're not breathing through HEPA filter, uh, like clean air, so your allergies will really get activated. So def instead of like, you, you c he came to me and asked me about no nose spray. I mean, I assume you're in your 20s, right? I'm 39. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of like, so it also sounds like you've been using nasal steroid or antihistamine, you said antihistamine. So uh, just to go back to that, antihistamine is not the first drug of choice for treating allergic rhinitis. Um, it was already printed out in uh, 20, 2017 in our practice parameters that nasal uh, inhaled corticosteroid is the first dr drug of choice, and that would be your nasal spray over the counter. Um, not the uh, efferent type, but the inhaled corticosteroid type. That is the first drug of choice for anybody over uh, age 12 for both seasonal and perennial rhinitis. Um, but, uh, but Ari was uh, asking me about uh, the safety of inhaled corticosteroid, and that is a different, uh, that's a different story that I'm not going to have time to address right now. But I would really go back and treat your allergies because if your nose is congested, it's going to be, that's where your nasal resistance is. That's going to make your sleep disorder worse. Yeah, for sure. So I, I use um, various decongestant nasal sprays like Afrin uh, right. prior to sleep. And uh, prior to that, I do a uh, saline, nasal saline wash. Uh, so Afrin cannot be used for more than three, maximum five days in a row. And there is a definite rebound, and the more you use it, the worse your nose is going to get. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing, uh, almost of the over counter that I don't advise on. Um, so the better way would be go to see an allergist and have your allergies treated properly, and that would be in the terms of desensitization. Right. So I'm sure that's good advice in many cases. Uh, in my case, when I was younger, I did go to see an allergist and have allergy shots. And my uh, mother pulled me out of it because my allergies were becoming much, much more severe. Um, now, again, that was a long time ago. Maybe it makes sense for me to, to investigate that again. However, a few years ago, I went in for a skin allergy test and they, um, they ended the test early uh, be, because of the, the size of the welts that were growing on my arm. They're like, oh, wow, that's really amazing. Let's just, you know, not wait the 20 minutes or whatever it was to measure the size and just give you the antihistamine now. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to try that again. Um, so to counteract that, do you know what, your, uh, what you're most allergic to? Um, many types of tree, grass pollen. What and about the course, dust? Um, pr I don't remember specifically, but probably. Yeah. Um, I, I would probably revisit that again. Uh, I would really encourage you to uh, go back to the allergist and revisit that. I mean, obviously, you know, we don't want to uh, ex do the whole concept here. <laughs> but I would, really go, I would really go back and talk to the allergist and see what other medications are there because there are more medications out, out there to treat this. Uh, I would, and then the other thing I want to point out is that um, it seems that your postnasal drip is also triggering some reflux, or is always bidirectional because reflux uh, in a small trial uh, it can actually cause rhinitis too. So you have to treat both in order to treat you correctly. Uh, so those were my comments. And because you know you started as a child and you're male. I would be also worried about uh, a reflux disorder called eosinophilic eosophagitis. That was one of the things that flagged, my, flagged me when I saw your note. And that, that, again, you have to go back and talk to the allergist about it. So you can't just treat the nose, you have to treat both. Okay. Um, Ari, I think um, there's some other um, providers that can also give you advice, but uh, because I want to try to keep us on time, um, so thank you so very much. And at the break, I think the other providers will reach out to you. Okay, so I wanted to actually highlight Jan um, Janie. And um, Janie, if you were coming to the multidisciplinary clinic, what would bring you here? What would be, what would be some of your concerns? <laughs> um, just that I, I feel like I've been on PAP therapy since, what, 2013 but I still struggle with sleepiness during the day. In fact, 
er, during the earlier panel when I was sitting out in the audience, there were a couple of times I was ready to doze off. And that's just kind of a bit frustrating for me about that. And um, let's see, I, you know, as he was, sh as Ari was sharing it, I tried to, it brought up some wonderings I had about, well, I know like in the mornings I have marks on the side of my tongue from my teeth, so I wonder, oh, is my tongue too big? You know, and, and then also, um, uh, more than the average person, I tend to get saliva kind of going down the wrong hatch and then I go into these major coughing fits. And the third thing was, um, you know when people tell you to breathe in slowly and breathe out slowly? I find a real struggle in breathing in slowly. I can breathe out super slow, but breathing in, you know, kind of so-so. But I went from APAP to BiPAP to ASV, so in terms of my diagnosis. Um, so I think um, you mentioned many things that um, each of us actually could comment on. But in, just in the interest of time, um, we'll have 15 minutes for your case and then 15 minutes for Adam's case. Um, if Shannon could comment on um, the efficacy of her CPAP. I'm sorry, it caused you to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really common um, concern that comes up in clinic, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you, were, um, you wanted to bring it up today. Um, because in truth, you can, Patient can come to the clinic with a concern for excessive daytime sleepiness or, or sleeping, accidentally falling asleep at times when they'd rather be awake. It can be a big challenge for social relationships, for work, for driving and driving accidents, those kinds of things. So um, we have to be on, we have to get on it. And so, of course, you go through your sleep study, you get a diagnosis of sleep apnea, the next thing you know, you're on a machine. The machine says you're doing great, uh, numbers look good, patient's not better. Okay, are we done? No, we are not done because the patient has, has, has not had the symptoms that they came in with resolved for them. And so there's sort of a differential of things you do at that point. The first thing you do is make sure that the sleep apnea is really treated. And this is, in my experience, pretty common that even though the device data looks beautiful, there are little ticks and fleas, there are little things that aren't set quite right that are, dis that are disturbing and per precipitating continued sleepiness. So for example, device data could look great, but if you're awake with it for half of the time that you're wearing it, you're not logging enough hours of sleep, you're not getting the REM sleep that you need, like the gentleman mentioned earlier, you're still gonna be sleepy during the day. What do we need to do about that? We need to try, we need to think critically about how we're treating the sleep apnea. And like you said, someone was doing that for you. You went to bi-level, you went to adapt uh, ASV, either auto or adapt SV, um, probably if there were mask issues, you were mentioning some drooling and, and oral issues, trying different masks, those kinds of things. I'm going to bring you into the lab for that. Um, so that's one thing. Some people, so that's all with the assumption that the, sleep, that the sleepiness is due to the sleep apnea. Okay? So then if you assume the sleepiness is due to the sleep apnea, you're going to try to treat the sleep apnea as well as you can. You go with the device, it's a gold standard. There are many other therapies and adjunct adjunctive therapies or complementary therapies that, that we need to think about to treat your sleep apnea. And this panel, these guys are a blue ribbon panel and can talk to you a lot about that. So I'm going to leave that to them. But, um, but what if you optimally treat the sleep apnea and you're still sleepy? Okay. One possibility is that you have some sleepiness due to another condition, or 40% of your sleepiness is sleep apnea, the other 60% is something else. So from a medical perspective, if that's where we're sitting, we're trying to make a determination, we do a few things. The first thing we do is we measure your sleepiness. There is a test for this, and um, someone brought up earlier, look, at times you need to advocate. There are, are times we needed to come into the lab and really understand your manifest degree of sleepiness. And so there's specialized daytime testing that can be done to really, did you get it done? Um, they tried twice, but I wasn't able to sleep through the night, so they canceled the ah, daytime. Ah, right, okay. 
So the, day, so the, the daytime test is um, depending on what, what they're evaluating. If you're someone who um, needs to establish that you can stay awake for a prolonged period, for example, a professional driver or something like this, um, you might, your clinician may recommend that you get something called a maintenance of wakefulness test or an MWT. If we're measuring the degree of sleepiness, how, how quickly you can fall asleep in quiet, boring circumstances, if given the opportunity, that would be an MSLT, your mean sleep latency test. So you can, you can do the testing, but it requires that you sleep six hours the night before. And so right away, you guys are imagining, wow, this seems like a very precious, very non-world type of test. And that's correct, because we're going to bring you into the lab. We're going to put all these wires on you and tell you to, who's gotten this one, sleep normally okay, for the night. And then we're going to see how well you perform the next day. Already, there are some issues, um, because you know it's a laboratory setting. and so. Um, what you were saying about, well, I couldn't sleep enough um, the night before my nap test during the day. That's right. And then, um, then it's difficult to be able to interpret the results when you know someone has not slept the night before and you're testing daytime sleepiness. So those tests can get canceled. However, it's important to follow up with your clinician and decide, okay, well, now where do we go? Because um, this issue of daytime sleepiness is of critical importance. Like we spoke about earlier, the risk of accidents the, the burden on folks for their employment, for their performance, for their social relationships, it cannot be ignored. Y y one must not resign oneself that this is going to be the way it is. And it's, impor it's important to measure that. Other medical disorders that are coexisting can also be associated with sleepiness, and it's important to evaluate for those. I brought up earlier, but I want to point out again, and, and, and you reminded me, <laughs> that getting enough hours of sleep is, a, is really important for sleepiness. If you're chronically sleep deprived, um, again, you can wear your mask faithfully, but if it's not for enough hours because you only committed to five hours of sleep a night or six hours of sleep a night, um, it may not be enough. And so those are the types of things that are evaluated. Finally, um, there are medications that are approved to help with daytime sleepiness and folks who have um, sleep apnea and whose sleep apnea is not, or sleepiness is not fully resolved by treating the sleep apnea as best they can. Um, in fact, there's a new medication um, on the market that just FDA just approved this summer in August last month. Um, so this is a, a really a worthwhile um, conversation to have um, because again, the clinical, the consequences can be so profound in your life. And so what I would say is don't give up. You got to just keep moving the ball down the field little by little and evaluate these. Um, and I bet you have. <laughs> I'm looking at Adam. Um, you have to really evaluate these possibilities because the really important thing is to um, not leave any stone unturned um, until you get to where you need to be. Um, and actually, Christina uh, could comment on some of the muscle dysfunction. Okay, so you really were highlighting multiple elements there. You had said there was scalloping on the sides of your tongue. Um, so that's a huge red flag for me, and I definitely want to make sure that there is room on the hard palate for your tongue. So I definitely would want to know if my orthodontist or my surgeon are concerned, um, or if I do m maybe want to make a referral. But that tells me the tongue is sitting forward and your mouth is touching those teeth. We need to change where that tongue is sitting, okay? So remember that tip of the tongue should be back in the mouth, up in that end spot, the rest of the tongue should be sealed, it's been lightly suctioned away, okay? Um, the, you said there was discoordination, you were kind of choking on your saliva, so it sounds like there's discoordination and likely weakness in your tongue, okay? So we want to make sure that your swallow mechanism and the kinematics of that swallow or the actual movements of the swallow are accurate and they're moving properly. Okay, so we'd probably do a little bit of swallowing retraining with you, okay? Mm -hmm. It's actually fast and easy. It's the teenage boy's favorite treatment, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but everyone is pretty, that's my most compliance. Everyone's compliant with swallowing treatment. We have to eat every day. Yeah. Um, and then um, you had spoke about the, bre uh, the breathing as well, and it's hard to breathe slow, and it's hard to think about your breathing, and we get in our head when it comes to breathing. So that's something we take, we break it down and we work slow, okay? And we work on that in step-by-step -step pieces. Because we can, I had said this example to a couple of people earlier, we wouldn't run into a marathon tomorrow, right? I mean, maybe a couple of you, but not me. Um, and so we would work on that step-by-step, -step, okay? And I'm gonna pass it on, because I do want to talk about the orthodontic piece, because maybe there isn't room on that mouth 
for the, t the tongue. So I'm going to pass it on to Stacy actually to talk about that. Um, so I think, um, uh, again, I, 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 I want to make sure we stay on time. I, I'm somebody who always tends to go over time. So um, we would do an evaluation to make sure if there's adequate space. Uh, and um, that could be a treat, uh, treated appropriately. But one other avenue for treatment that I'm just going to briefly introduce would be some type of combination therapy, perhaps wearing an oral appliance with CPAP. Um, and depending upon your anatomy and the state of your teeth and the position, that would be evaluated whether or not that would be appropriate treatment option for you. Yeah. Actually, I, I did persuade um, my sleep doc to have me go for um, an overnight study to see if the oral appliance would work. And they said it didn't, that it actually doubled my, um, my apneas compared to when I first was diagnosed. So um, depending upon, I think, your severity of sleep apnea, but it's wonderful that you had the sleep study and didn't rely upon just the sleep apnea appliance alone. Mm -hmm. But I think that in, in potentially combination um, because it would change kind of the mechanics of how the muscles are going to function when you wear oh. the sleep appliance with the CPAP. Okay. So maybe I'll ask about that. Okay. And then our last panelist, um, Adam. Adam has been a long time patient of the clinic at Stanford. <laughs> um, many of us met him, actually him, and then many of us have met his, his daughter. So um, the last panelist we haven't heard from is Dr. Lee, and I would imagine that we would end this dialogue uh, really a dialogue between um, Adam and, and Dr. Lee. Yeah. Hi, Dr. And I just want to make one comment for the for, first two panelists, because <clears throat> we both talk about, both about oral appliance. Uh, we do combination therapy a lot, and, and just like, like the pr approach for surgery, it's not all or none. I do surgery a lot for patients to improve their ability to tolerate medical therapy, like Adam, okay, and which we'll talk about. So the concept of oral appliance it for in, in conjunction with CPAP is basically a small amount of advancement to open up the airway so people could tolerate the CPAP better with a lesser pressure and improve the efficacy of, of the CPAP use. A lot of people cannot cannot be benefited by just one therapy. And, and hence, you know, you see six of us here. And that uh, I rely and, and depend on everyone here to, to try to improve my patient's quality of life. And that's, that's something you need to think about. It's not that you have to advance your jaw five millimeter. Maybe two or three millimeter will be enough to just so that you could tolerate the CPAP better and that reduce the side effect of oral appliance. Okay, so on to Adam. So Adam, Adam has severe sleep apnea, okay? And, uh, and if, if Adam comes into my, to, to my office and wanting to have surgery, I'm gonna say, you know, uh, the key of surgery really is patient selection. And what, what am I able to do to help this patient improve his or her quality of life and their health? So single modality in terms of surgery to try to eliminate CPAP or BiPAP um, I would say, I would tell Adam that it's, I don't think it's realistic because the severity of sleep apnea, the anatomy, and, and there are a lot of different factors. So we have to consider uh, what are the risk factors in terms, what, what are the prognostic factors in improving uh, someone with surgery. So Adam's been using, using uh, a BiPAP for a long time and he has significant uh, fair amount of, well, Adam, how's your, how's your nasal breathing? How's your BiPAP experience? I am as compliant of a CPAP originally, then AutoPAP, and now BiPAP a patient as you'll ever meet. Doesn't mean it solved all my problems. I, ne I needed other help, whether it's Dr. Choi and my allergist, Dr. Kuo and, and, and any potential orthodontic treatment, uh, my psychotherapist, I'm on a, 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 a pharmaceutical to help with my, my sleep and my anxiety. Um, but my breathing now that we've done this intervention with Dr. Lee, I literally can breathe twice as better in my estimation with my nose because before it was so small I couldn't even get the air through it. So I can breathe now and expand my upper airway and use more of my lungs. It helped realign my, the cervical issues in my neck. 
help get a lot of the, 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 the sinus and barometric pressures off in my face. Because I can now use my nose for what it was designed for. The way I always understood it was the nose is for breathing and the mouth is for eating and talking. <laughs> You know, a lot of times as an otolaryngologist, we'll talk about correcting a deviated septum, reducing the turbinates. Obviously, we want to make sure that allergies are ma well managed. But a lot of times, patients will come in and they say, well, I already had my nasal surgery done. I already had this done. I, already, my, I don't have any allergies, and I still have problem breathing through my nose. And which goes back to, to the, um, the, the talks this morning about, about narrow palates and et cetera. And Adam's palate is quite narrow. Okay, so when you have a, a, a narrow jaw, you tend to have a narrow nose, and therefore we talk about maxillary expansion, which is what Adam had. That we, I expanded the nose for him, and and he, you know, it, it it is something that, as otolaryngologists, it's not something you think about because that's not really in in, in your bag of tools, so so to speak. So it requires a background in oral maxillofacial surgery and orthodontia. So that, again, it comes back to a multidisciplinary approach, uh, which is, uh, I'm just going to tell a funny story. In 1998, Christian and I um, were sitting around talking because we're seeing patients, and then, then we start talking, talking to the parents, and, and we start asking them about questions about their kids, and, you know, and, and all these symptoms in pediatrics. And then we asked them, okay, well, you know, they, they can't come into to the clinic and they have to pay. So we started this Friday afternoon. We don't have, fellows don't have clinics. So it's a Friday afternoon clinic. And, and the multidisciplinary treatment was really, um, it's, we told people it's five different specialists. Um, sleep specialists and pediatric, that's Chris John, and dentistry, oral surgery, and ENT, that was me. So it's really two people. <laughs> but, you know, then soon, we realized we can't do it all, okay? It's so complicated, and that's why we needed um, everyone here to, to really be able to help our patients and, and uh, improve their, their quality of life, um, so. You know, the, one of the reasons we, I chose this intervention, there was a couple of things that Dr. Lee, I won't say sold me on, but helped convince me to go over the finish line to where I do this. 10 years ago, when I was first diagnosed by Dr. Gimeno, you know, I was 100% compliant with CPAP. He brought me to you and said, if you're wearing your CPAP, there's no reason for me to do anything on you. We don't want to go down that. Now, over 10 years, and people want to know about the innovation that's going on in this field, this technique that Dr. Lee and Dr. Quo uh, have been doing, uh, they've only been doing for the last year and a half? A couple of years. A couple of years. Um, I was able to have this intervention and literally in post-op have my BiPAP on. So I always was heard the fears of, from Will, our board chairman, uh, Air, uh, and who's on our board of that MMA, that I was going to have to spend three days in the ICU and hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills. And if you've ever been in the ICU, you don't go in there voluntarily if you can avoid it. Um, so knowing that I could do this surgery and still wear my mask and recover it and avoid all that other stuff was really a help. I did this surgery because I was already at the maximum pressure on my BiPAP at 45 years old. I'm worried about the next 20 years because I don't know if this machine is going to still be effective for me. So when, when, when they presented to me this option and this new innovation, it was like, we could lower your pressure and buy you probably another good amount of time to where that BiPAP's still going to help in combination therapy, along with my pharmaceutical, along with making sure I eat foods that I'm not allergic to and I'm breathing clean air. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, how we got to this point. So one of the benefits, I was just doing this to lower the pressure. I didn't know I was going to be able to breathe better. I didn't know a lot of my cervical stuff and my posture would change. Huh. I didn't know the sinus issues that I always, I always thought I had such a small face. This is just what you had to deal with in life. You know, I, literally, my wife and I lived 15 miles across that bridge, and I'm looking at it, and we left here because I was a boy in a glass house because I was living, I couldn't go outside, I couldn't breathe the air. So if my, mm -hmm. if my allergies were bad, then my CPAP therapy wasn't working. It was a vicious cycle. Huh. So this, this summer, we're back out here, convalescing, and I'm breathing better out here than I do in Florida now. <laughs> now, is that temporary? We don't know, because I haven't been exposed to all these allergens, but that's the kind of dramatic change that I've seen as a result of where we're at, and thank God for these doctors and this innovation that, you know, we can do this stuff less invasively now and get people in and out and do it for younger kids where their suture isn't sealed up and, and expand them and, and hopefully prevent anyone from ever having sleep apnea. 
And that's, that's really the long-term goal and the end game here is. Now, Adam, Adam had, his, had the nasal maxer expansion, so he's breathing better. Now that he's developed a little bit of central sleep apnea on his, on his machine, so I'm going to have Dr. Sullivan talk about it uh, in terms of managing, changing the pressure after an expansion. Sorry, Adam, I was going to talk to you later. <laughs> but why not invite a few people along? <laughs> so, um, you know, what, so this is interesting because as new techniques come along, we're all learning together. Um, and what I've learned about this particular procedure, the EAST procedure, which is an expansion procedure, is that pressure requirements, if they're going to go down, go pretty quickly, faster than what I would have expected. And how did I learn that? I listened to my patients. Uh, because they pretty quickly tell you that they're waking up all the time, they feel the air is too strong. Uh, you start to see some central apneas creep into the data on the cards. And by the way, this is not necessarily a different disorder. It's the brainstem responding to improved breathing by saying, hey, I can take a pause every once in a while because I am now overventilated relative to what I was expecting. So, and these things come out in the wash, but it's a sign that you, you need to lower the pressures. Um, in your case, this would not be true in all cases, so you want to work with someone on this. Um, but but th that is one of the things we learned about the procedure, that the pressure requirements rapidly go down to their new settling point. That's right, Dr. Choi. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, my daughter was the first one who was on CPAP, and we did the E. And then she came back to me and said, Mom, I am so tired. <laughs> and then when we actually look at her HI and all that, it was sky high. So I said, oh, better talk to Dr. Sullivan and drop the pressures. And that, yeah. that's another great point that, that really sold me, is that I knew that these doctors down here were willing to do this on their own children. And uh, you know, and I, I remember asking Dr. Gimeno years ago when we first diagnosed my daughter at the time at two, she had an HI 27. And you know the recommendation at that time was, was we got to take the tonsils and adenoids out. And I said to him, he said, well, you know they, they can't. You know the doctor said they can't schedule this for three, four months. And I said, I go, if this was your daughter, or your granddaughter, what would you do? He goes, I'd take him out yesterday. <laughs> and that was Dr. Gimeno. There was you know don't pass go. This he knew the intervention, and literally within 24 hours, I had a different child. There are other further interventions that we've been doing over these years, but that was that was crucial. Tonsils and adenoids are not common anymore for children. That's, that, to me, is, a, is an issue. Not that I'm advocating it one way or the other, but the fact that we're seeing higher rates of childhood obesity and things like that, I'm willing to bet and hypothesize as a citizen scientist and as a layman that there's a correlation here that needs to be looked at. Yeah, I just want to echo what you said. I think that's right. You, you, we, need, we rely on one another. Right. And if we really want to get our patients across the finish line and really optimally treated, you need representatives from all of these specialties to be able to work on this. And your point earlier, Ari, is so important that, you know, sleep apnea holds hands with a lot of other things that could be going on in terms of your health. And these relationships are not in one direction, they are bi-directional. So if you think about anxiety and depression, yeah, it can make sleep worse. Guess what? When you're not sleeping well, it perpetuates these disorders as well. And so that these relationships being bi-directional require multidisciplinary approaches. I think we're going to end. I just want to make one comment. Um, you can see everyone here is very classy and elegant and the way they approach patients and giving them recommendations. I'm, I'm not. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I tell it as it is. I'm very blunt. Um, I just want to make a comment for, for Ari uh, and, and really for every patient is that uh, when you were having all the welts and allergies and not responding to allergy shots and at that time if 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 I saw you I would say go see a different allergist <laughs> you know if you're not getting improvement or help by your doctor find another doctor <laughs> okay it's it's not 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 every doctor is going to be able to help you not one doctor will be the end all and cure all Okay, so this day and age, it, it, I can tell you the field of sleep has become so complicated and there's so many people that's involved in a field which I'm not so sure that they should be. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and it is even harder to navigate as patients. 
Um, and you have to be your own advocate and do some research, look, look for organizations um, such as this and, and, and you know, gain knowledge so you can help and, and, and navigate and, and um, be healthier. Thanks. Thank you. I think we uh, want to do another polling question. Yeah. So if everyone wants to see how this question that's on our survey, how it relates to the panel we just did. I think the question says, how well informed was your primary care doctor about sleep when you first discussed this topic with them? And our choices are well informed, A, B, quite informed, C, not well informed, and D, I did not discuss sleep apnea with my doctor. <laughs> so CC seems to be coming in as the leader right now. Which over 50% of, yep. We'll give our online audience some time. Um, I want to just sort of attribute one other thing to this multidisciplinary team, and that is, if you think about this from a business and a logistics standpoint, how much time would it take Ari or, or, or Janie to go and meet with the orthodontist, to meet with a cognitive behavioral therapist, to meet with a sleep doctor, to meet with a surgeon, to meet with the allergist, to meet with a sleep pathologist? You just met with six specialists in 20 minutes. Imagine if they were looking at your whole case and you, had to, you were in their clinic for an hour. That's the way our patients need to be treated. Sleep apnea has always been thought of as a, as a soft disease, not a death disease, but we really are the precursor, whether sleep apnea or just interfere sleep for cradle to grave, chronic disease to rare, from dementia, cardiovascular, all the way down to early childhood development. And it takes a team and it takes shared decision making. The old traditional model does not work. The system is not set up for it to work. That is why we have an organization, and that's why we're providing the support that the system's not. So I didn't promise you all the answers here today, but I promise you that there's other doors to go through. And as Dr. Lee said, if you're not getting the answers from the one doctor, be your advocate. You know, we're cognitive sleep deprived. Sleep deprived. You need to trust your instinct and go find another. Literally, the difference in me being alive here today is 15 miles. I was correctly originally diagnosed at UCSF and treated, but it took a year of getting somewhat better before I realized I need to go 15 miles down the road to see the best of the best. Not because I wanted to see the best, because I still wasn't feeling well. And it took me, I would say, maybe a couple years with Dr. Gimeno to, to, to work through with Dr. Choi and the allergies. Went to the GI doctor, I have hiatal hernia, make sure the silent reflux is actually related to the apnea, not so I don't need to take Prilosec all day. Um, we then went, met with a psychotherapist, realized I'd been sleep deprived my whole life. I needed, a, I needed to be on Prozac to help reorganize my sleep architecture, uh, all my fibromyalgia went. So this didn't happen overnight. This has been a long, persevering thing. And we're survivors. We didn't get here because we were dumb. We got here because we're functioning on probably one-tenth of our capability our whole life. But you're at a point where you're smarter than you think you are because you're trying to figure this out because you only know what you know. I was in your position. Dr. Gimeno used to yell at me when I, early days and I was looking at my data and I started lowering the data. He's like, listen, you don't know what you're talking about yet. He goes, I need your airway open at a certain pressure. Now I'm gonna treat that first. We'll worry about the rest of the stuff after. And that was, that's just been this whole experience. So I want our awake network, which was always set up for one intervention. I want it to become what you guys just experienced in this first round robin where you can go meet with all the different innovators and all the specialists and understand what door you walk through, what answer you're gonna be giving, and what perspective you're gonna be giving. So we wanna take this model that we're doing here today in the room, this is really a pilot awake meeting. This has never been done before. It's bold for six providers and professionals to be on camera and talk about cases. That's a liability issue. That's a liability issue just looking at that bridge right now for a lot of doctors to even wanna come and talk about our afternoon topic. So, this meeting, everyone should be, should be, should be proud and, and, and understand that this is, this is not the norm. This is the exception. Our job is to take what we're doing here today and to take it around the country so that any doctor in any city can go and recruit their multidisciplinary team and bring in those specialists so that if they have an awake meeting, our patients can show up at whatever city they're in and meet with six specialists that understand that this is all related. And that is our hope for the future, and that was the hope for Do of Dr. Gimeno. 
So I just, I just wanted to end with that. And uh, after that, we're ready for break. Or, or uh, question, I'm sorry, sorry, Steve. <laughs> ADD kicked in a little. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say something very quickly. And um, I know it's like I feel like the nose is a poor re uh, relation to the other specialties. But, you know, the nose is where you put your CPAP through, right? And um, so I, I, I would um, encourage you guys to pay more attention to your nose. And as far as um, allergists is concerned, I feel uh, kind of really bad because um, I think um, as, as, as an allergist, uh, we have so many other diseases out there like e eczema, asthma, chronic sinusitis that we have to address and they're more measurable disease uh, for, an for an allergist anyway that we really forget about the sleep disorder as a secondary effects on our patient. We, we, we forget about that. And so I would encourage you that if you have any rhinitis, uh, rhinitis symptoms, is to really go and go back to your allergies and basically ask to be evaluated properly and say, hey, you know, what does my airway look like? How big is my terminates? Because, um, you know, the bigger your terminates, the more pressure you have to use on your CPAP to drive through that terminates in order to get around the back of the throat unless you want to mouth breathe. So just be persistent and educate your allergist as well, I must have to say, <laughs> um, uh, to say, hey, I really need my nose to be open so I can use my CPAP. I think that's a great comment, Dr. Choi, and, I, I, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, our immune system is directly correlated to the quality of our sleep. So if our immune system is corrupted because our sleep's corrupted, we're probably going to have a harder time dealing with the allergies. It wasn't that my allergies were so bad. It was that I had no defense ability. So once I got to sleep under control, I was then able to manage the allergies. So whether it was in the house and having a HEPA system and casings for your bed and not breathing in dust all night or the foods that I were eating that were inflammatory. So there's, there's all these different components, but I couldn't make sense out of these day one. It took this whole journey to piece it all together in hindsight. Yeah, that was actually my slide that I want to put up that um, allergies does affect uh, OSA and OSA affect allergies. Yeah. Can we have a question over here? Yeah, um, I've been hearing uh, um, a comment made, let's see, by Jamie, by Adam, by Christina. We've all been talking about the quality of breathing during sleep at night. Peter and I had a conversation yesterday and I haven't heard anybody mention this in the bouquet of multiple symptoms to get to the diagnosis of sleep apnea. Is there the flip side, an apnea during a wakefulness day? Has there been a characteristic, because I have it, where I'm not breathing during the day and people have to kick me and remind me, coworkers, friends, family, gym coaches, that's when it first started getting it. Has any research been done into those of us who un involuntarily discover we're not breathing during the day? Just, I'm curious, and could this be folded into your research? So breathing uh, during wakefulness is under control of, it's interesting, it's under control of a number um, of different centers in the brain and they respond to different instructions. And so breathing during the day, um, it's one of the, it's the only autonomic function uh, that we actually have cortical control over, meaning that you can control if you think about it. So you can't reliably tell your heart double the number of times you beat just because you said it. You can try to think of anxious thoughts, but you can actually hold your breath. And if you say, I want to breathe twice as frequently, you can do that. So you have cortical control. It's pretty unique. So it's conscious control. There's a variety of other controls. Um, some of them are chemical. So you have a, in your brain uh, something that assesses the tension of oxygen, actually the tension of carbon dioxide um, in your arterial blood. And, and so part of, um, part of control of breathing is based on that chemistry. Um, you also have emotional input. So you have other parts of the brain that feed to the brain stem that are related to your emotional state. If you're angry, if you're excited, if you're calm and relaxed, 
um, if you've been exercising, actually. So all of these different things are at play at the same time. And what that means is that with all of these different spices in the pot, uh, what you're experiencing, if you're noticing that you're not breathing. Was it me? When you were sleeping. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Hello? OK. You good? That, um, that, that if you notice you're not breathing, it could be from a variety. Um, it could be from a perturbation of, of one of those or a relationship between them. So in terms of basic science of control of breathing, a lot has been done. Um, what could be going on in your case is, um, is, is worth pursuing, um, in particular if there's a clinical consequence. So for example, if breathing is associated with uh, feeling lightheaded or passing out, uh, that's something that should be pursued right away. Uh, but, but, there are, but there are clinical sort of evaluations that can be done for that. And typically one would see a pulmonologist to help, to help evaluate that. What the connection is to sleep, which was your other question, depends on what the driver is during the day. There might be or there may not be. Hold on one second, I'll bring this over. Justine has many talents, everybody. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to make a comment to Ari. Your story really touched me. And as a child growing up with a heart condition, I made up a very elaborate story of how I caused my heart condition. My daughter has a lot of muscle <coughs> issues and ended up with shortened heel cords. And she made up a very elaborate story of why she caused her shortened heel cords. And I think what I want to say to you is this is not your fault. You did not cause this. And I think that's really important to understand. There are other things going on, but you are not the cause of this. Thank you. I think you couldn't have said it any better, Janice. I think that's, you know, it's, it's a good reminder for all, all the patients in the room, pre-diagnosis, pre-treatment, and after, you know. It's, people used to say, oh, you sleep apnea is the excuse. It's, it's, it's not the excuse, it just made, it, it helped make me make sense of everything that transpired to get to this point today. And, you know, you're here for a reason. You're still not where you want to be but you've got six more doors to now walk through that might be able to help you out and help you figure out what the right combination is for you. Yeah. And that's, that's the point of what, why we're here. So. I think one thing that I would like to tell my younger self is, because I was you know, going through this kind of perpetual exhaustion and then uh, it's also obviously very wearing emotionally going to different doctors, getting different drugs and treatments, and it's time after time being disappointed with the results. And so it's really important to sort of accept where you are, but not give up, right? Keep going. Because there were many times when I could have just given up and said, all right, that's it. I'm just gonna, you know, live in my mom's basement for my whole life, and that's the end of it. Um, so it's important to push through that exhaustion, really cultivate your emotional stamina, and, you know, keep trying. Um, I wanted to uh, just speak to what both of you guys folks have said and then we'll wrap it up. But, you know, one of Dr. Gimeno's initiatives was a multidisciplinary clinic. Another one of his initiatives was really prevention because he really believed that from much of sleep apnea, it, you were born with it. And so it was present um, actually in utero. And there's some, he has um, many papers and there's a meeting, he's world sleep meeting that um, some of his ideas will, will be presented at that meeting. Um, so. Um, I wanted to thank the panelists for really sharing your medical history with everyone. It's such a personal, um, a personal struggle, and we really appreciate um, um, Ari, Janie, and Adam for uh, opening it up to all of us so that we can all learn from it. So thank you very much. Thank you, doctors. And thank you. And thank you all for being here with us today and taking time out of your busy schedules to you know, uh, talk to our community and get this message out um, that it is important for you to be an advocate for yourself. Go and seek out additional help, and um, we're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you.